Good morning. Glad you are here with us this morning. We are going to be in the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings, we're going to start there, and we're going to be in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles and a couple of places today. We are talking about deceptions, right? Deceptions. As you're turning there, I just want to again uh, ask you to be praying for our VBS. It is this week we have the opportunity to be able to teach Scripture and, uh, uh, and love on kids that will be here. 112, did you say, signed up? 112 signed up. And, and we have to face the reality that every kid that comes here does not have a wonderful home life. It's unfortunate, but we live in a broken world, and the Lord is giving us opportunities to bless these kids. Maybe these kids are coming and they've not had a hug all week, right? Maybe they need love, and uh, I pray that we can, we can provide that for them. Matter of fact, we're just going to pause for a moment, and uh, if, you are, if you are volunteering anywhere in VBS, would you raise your hand? Amen. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. I'm going to pray for you. Let's pray together. Father, we ask you, Lord, for your strength, for your guidance, for your insight and your discernment for all of these workers, Lord. You are bringing to us children and families that, Lord, we can make a great impact for your glory. And I pray, Lord, that you will prepare each worker each child, each family, Lord, to be able to present the gospel and receive the gospel, that they will know you. Lord, so many of these children come, and they need much more, Father, and, and I pray that you will give us the discernment to see that. I pray that there will be many kids that come to know Christ this week, and Lord, many families that will come to know Christ, and that they will be changed, Lord. We know that you are the answer, and you are the one that solves all the problems that we have, Lord. And we ask that many of these kids, Lord, that come will find their answer in you. Lord, I pray for strength for every worker. Lord, as it is challenging with all these energetic and wonderful kids, Lord, it is a challenge. But, Lord, I pray for strength upon strength, mercy upon mercy. Lord, wisdom upon wisdom. And, and that your words will flow through them, Lord God, like honey dripping from the comb. You are good, Father, and we give this prayer to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We, can, we should never miss an opportunity to be able to, to change somebody's life with Jesus, right? Uh, last week, we talked about what goes around comes around, or does it? right? The understanding of karma, how it is a deception that has gotten into the church, and a lot of people think that that is, uh, that is true. What goes around comes around. But we looked at Scripture last week that that is indeed not the case, right? We understand that we have just one life to live on this earth, right? Then comes the judgment, and then we understood that it is important how we live this life. Right? And then lastly, we talked about how grace changes everything. When we understand and grasp the fact that Jesus came and, and gives us freedom by his sacrifice and resurrection, and that we are washed clean from our sins, and, and that compels us to love him and to obey him and to see him move uh, in our lives. Today, we're going to be talking about the deception of God can't do that. God can't do that. If you think about it, we live in incredible times, right? We have technology that has affected every area of our lives. If you've got a smartphone in your pocket, it holds far more information than the greatest supercomputer known on the earth in the 50s. That's in your pocket. We have scientific advancements, right? I mean, we have the, the, the computer technology almost turns over every year how fast everything is growing, right? We have technology and science, and, and we have medical discoveries all the time, and all these things are happening. We have 
movies that can take us to other planets and, and they can portray other worlds and it looks so real, right? But I, I think a lot of this has a negative effect on our view of God because in many ways we can explain what goes on around us, or at least we think we can explain what goes on around us, right? And we've become very materialistic, not as in wanting things, but we've become very focused on things that we can see, right? When, in essence, God is spirit. We can't see Him, but we can see Him working everywhere. And we have minimized our view of what God can do. And see, that's what the world wants to do. The world wants us to be in a situation to where we question how much God can do. Right? We question, well, God can't really do that. I mean, this problem that I've got, boy, it's huge. I don't know if God can handle that. And, and we live our lives in a way that we fix our own, we try to fix our own problems. Nowhere in Scripture does it say to fix your own problems? Now, it says to seek the Lord, and then he, he will lead us to do things. But you see, we just love to get on it ourselves and try to fix it, and we often make a mess of it. And then we have to ask the Lord to fix it later. And then not only the original problem we had, but the things that we messed it up with. Right? Can I get a witness? You see, we have... We have neglected and forgotten about how awesome and powerful God is. We have forgotten that the God that we worship, that we have access because of Christ, that He is the same God today that is the one that breathed and spoke everything into being. He is the same God that parted the waters. He is the same God that has healed and has changed and does, does incredibly miraculous things all around us. And we have forgotten how awesome He is. In this passage, the several passages we're going to look at today, we're going to see that in this historical event, and I, and I love Scripture because it is historically based, right? We know that, that Hezekiah, we have evidence of the writings of Hezekiah. We know about the Assyrian king Sennacherib. We know about all this, right? It is history, and we have it recorded in our Scripture. And as we read this, I think the Lord wants us to understand that the world is trying to deceive us and tell us that God can't do that, whatever that is in your life. But I'll affirm today that God can do that. He can do that. Let's get into the, into the Word. We're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 18. We're going to begin reading in verse 13 this morning. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities in Judah and captured them. So Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent word to the king of Assyria at Lachish and said, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you demand from me, I will pay. The king of Assyria demanded 11 tons of silver and one ton of gold from King Hezekiah of Judah. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver found in the Lord's temple and in the treasuries of the king's palace. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the Lord's sanctuary and from the doorposts he had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. Then the king of Assyria sent the tartan the Rab Saris and the Rab Shekah, along with a massive army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. They advanced and came to Jerusalem, and they took their position by the aqueduct of the upper pool, which is by the highway to the fuller's field. Then they called for the king. But Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was in charge of the palace, Shebna, the court secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the court historian, came out to meet them. Then the Rabshakeh said to them, Tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria, says. What are you relying on? You think mere words are strategy and strength for war? What are you now relying on so that you have rebelled against me? Look, you are now trusting in Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff that will enter and pierce the hand of anyone who leans on it. This is how Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is to all who trust in him. Suppose you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God. Isn't he the one 
whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you must worship at this altar in Jerusalem. So now make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I'll give you 2,000 horses if you're able to supply riders for them. How then can you drive back a single officer among the least of my master's servants and trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Have I attacked this place to destroy it without the Lord's approval? The Lord said to me, attack this land and destroy it. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, Shebna, and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, please speak to your servants in Aramaic since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew within earshot of the people on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said to them, Has my master sent me only to your master and to you to speak these words? Hasn't he also sent me to the men who sit on the wall, destined with you to eat their own excrement and, dry, and drink their own urine? The Rabshakeh stood, called out loudly in Hebrew. Then he spoke, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says, Don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He can't deliver you from my hand. Don't let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord by saying, certainly the Lord will deliver us. This city will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. Don't listen to Hezekiah, for this is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and surrender to me. Then every one of you may eat from his own vine and his own fig tree, and everyone may drink water from his own cistern until I come. And take away to a land, take you away to a land like your own land, a land of a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, so that you may live and not die. But don't listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land from the power of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Surveim and Hena and Eva? Have they, have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands has delivered his land from my power? So will the Lord deliver Jerusalem? You see, this is a story. Hezekiah was one that, that stood for the Lord. And Israel and Judah stood between Egypt and Assyria. At that time in history, they were the two world powers destined to, to dominate the world. E Egypt was coming up to try to, to, to get everyone, and then Assyria was coming down to try to get everyone to make it their kingdom. And now we see Assyria, and before this passage, we see Assyria had already attacked Israel. They had taken Samaria, and then they had taken all of the northern cities in Judah. Right? And so they were planning on Jerusalem next. That was the problem. He makes fun of them. He says, How, I'll give you 2,000 horses if you can give me men to ride them. Israel had already been defeated, and now Judah, the southern kingdom, was about to be defeated. And he's making fun of them. He says, y'all don't have the people to withstand us. Right? The first thing he says, he makes accusations, right? The accusations. First of all, he helps them to see very clearly that you should not trust Hezekiah. Verse 25. Well, he, he says, first of all, have I attacked this place to destroy it without the Lord's approval? The Lord said to me, attack this land and destroy it. The first thing the Rabshakeh does is he says that God is the one that sent him to take over Judah. God's the one that sent me. Don't you think that we wouldn't be here if God hadn't told us to? Well, we have to understand that he is not telling the truth in this case. He's saying, well, y'all took down the high places of God, and y'all took down all the idols, and now you say that everybody has to worship in Jerusalem, so you've obviously made your God angry. God is angry with you, and he has sent us to take over your kingdom. See, it's kind of funny because historically we know from the writings in Assyria that this was a ploy that the Assyrians did with every kingdom that they went to, to overcome. 
They had spies that would go in and learn the local religions and what God they depended upon. They would take it back to the Assyrian kings and all of the leaders, and they would say, okay, so we will tell them that their God, whoever their God was, is mad at them, and we have come to set the record straight. Right? Your God is the one who sent us. This is one of the devil's favorite ploys, is to try to blame God for the things that we find in our lives that are difficult. You've heard this before, right? You've said it in your head. You've had people tell you that. Well, God's the reason that you've got this problem. If you wouldn't be going to that church up there, guess what? You wouldn't have all these problems. If you didn't believe that God was all powerful and all this stuff, you've obviously made him mad. That's the reason you got all these problems. God's angry with you. Job's wife got in on it. Job's wife just told him, just curse God and die. Talk about encouragement. <laughs> but you see, that's what, that's what the devil tries to do. That's one of the great deceptions is that he wants to get us to question if God really loves us and if he really will take care of us. Right? That's one of the big questions he wants to plant in our heads and deceive us to try to think that God can't do that. Right? He's not even that interested in you in the first place. I mean, he is too busy with all the people in, in the, in the war-torn lands. He's too busy with all of the people that are in famine-torn lands. He's too busy with all this other stuff. And he tries to make God small and say that he can't handle all this at once, and you don't even need to ask him about this. You see, he tried to make God their enemy, and that is an accusation that the devil will use in our lives over and over and over again to try to get us to not depend upon the Lord and try to depend upon ourselves. The next accusation you see is Hezekiah can't save you, right? Who are you supposed to do, right? Are you supposed to, are you supposed to have uh, Hezekiah save you? This is what the Lord says in verse 29. Don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He can't deliver you from my hand. Hezekiah doesn't even know what he's talking about. Don't listen to those people. I mean, come on. He's just trying to get you to trust in God for your help. Really? How much has God done for you so far? I mean, what has God done for you lately? Boy, you hear that in the back of your head, don't you? You pray over something, and you keep praying, and you don't hear an answer. And then those voices in your head and in the flesh, and, and the, the devil likes to whisper in your ear, Psh! You just need to stop praying for that because God ain't, he's not listening. He's not listening. Just stop it. He's not interested in you. And that's a deception that we need to realize is, is just an awful deception. Here he wants to keep the people from listening, right, to their leader from Hezekiah, right? And I mean, you might as well just don't listen to the preacher, what he says. He's crazy. That may be the truth. But if I say anything good, it's his fault. Right? He, he's saying, don't listen to your Christian friends when they give you advice about the problems that you're, that you're in. Don't listen to them. Right? Don't listen to that, that co-worker of yours who, who wants to pray for you all the, all the stuff that you're going through. Really? You let them pray for you, but it ain't going to do no good. Don't listen to them. You see, the devil is deceptive, and he wants us to have that dis deception in our lives to where we don't trust those who follow the Lord. There's another deception, another accusation. Turn over and look at chapter 19, verse 10. Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, don't let your God, whom you trust in, deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be handed over to the king of Assyria. Hmm. Look, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the countries. They've completely destroyed them. Will you be rescued? Did the gods of those nations that my predecessors destroyed rescue them? Nations such as Gozan and Haran and Rezef and the Edenites of Telassar. Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Surveim, Hena and Iva? He's saying, don't you know your God can't save you? 
right? He's saying that don't listen to, to your neighbors. Don't listen to Hezekiah. He can't save you. God's not interested in you. And now he is bringing accusations against God himself. God can't save you. Look at all the nations that we have conquered. Did their God save them? No. Your God can't save you. Your God is too small. God can't come against us. Now understand, he is saying all this to Hezekiah and all of the, all the people in Jerusalem at the same time that the entire area is surrounded by the army of Assyria. Right? According to history, they had, they had probably half a million soldiers that they surrounded Jerusalem with. Half a million and they're getting all these accusations while they see this massive army all around them. You see, they don't want them to trust in the Lord. And let me tell you today, the devil does not want you to trust in the Lord. He wants you to do it yourself, right? He wants you to do it yourself. And, and the devil wants you to think that God is too small to forgive you of whatever you've done. God can't do that. I mean, look at your life. Look at all the things that you've done. I mean, that stuff you've done is not even in the Bible. It's that bad. You think God can forgive you of that? Yeah. Yeah, He can. And He wants us to get down. He wants to discourage us, right? He wants us to think that our problem is so bad that God can't even fix it. My marriage, my family, my health. Right? My situation, my finances, all of the, that, that it is so bad that even this, this God that you depend on can't do it. God can't do that. And that is a lie. The devil wants to discourage us, to keep us from depending upon the Lord. And he'll, he'll, he'll get you with this one too. Hey, psst, you made the mess of your life. Don't expect God to clean it up. You ever heard that one? You made your own mess. You work yourself out of it. And then maybe God will help you. And that's a lie. That is a lie. God helps us in the midst of all of it. Now look at the other, other thing that he does here. In the midst of all the accusations, he makes a promise. In verse 31, he says, Listen, make peace with me, surrender to me, then every one of you can eat from your own vine and your own fig tree, Everyone can drink from your own water in your own cistern until I come, and then I will take you away to a better land, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, so that you may live and not die. You see, God wants to deliver us from their hand, but the devil wants us to remain under his influence. And so he promises something in, in return. If you just don't depend on your God, Right, if you don't run to the Lord and, and all of that, then, then guess what? You'll still have a good life. You don't need God to have a good life. Right, if you just follow me, and he says here, if you'll just surrender, and that's the devil saying, you just surrender to me, I'll make sure that you've got an easy life. I'll make sure that you don't, you don't have to work for money too hard. You're going to be healthy. You're going to do all this stuff. I mean, it's going to, your life will be great. Just don't depend on your God. Just surrender to me, the devil says. See, the problem with all of those promises that he makes is they never, they never come to fruition. The devil always makes promises that he can't keep. Always. And he will make you a promise of all kinds. Just no, just don't run to the Lord. Just You can take care of it. Don't let God involve. Don't get God. He, he'll just mess it up. He'll make you go to church or something. He'll make you read your Bible every night. Oh, my gosh. I mean, God will demand something from you, and it won't be what I can provide, which is all of this land full of milk and honey and, and, and beauty and vines and vineyards and all of this. And the Lord provides far more. You see, the devil wants us to trust everybody else but him, but, but the Lord. Right? I mean, how does this sound? Just trust the government. They'll take care of you. <laughs> Let me just tell you, if we have more faith in our government than we do in the Lord, we've got, we got bigger problems. 
right? The devil wants us to trust in anything else. You see, the deception that is slipping into the church and people are receiving it and living it is discouragement from Satan. He wants you to be discouraged. He wants you to be down. He wants you to look at your situation that God can't help you with it instead of looking at the one true God that can do anything. He wants you to look at your problems. He wants you to look at your situations. And he wants you to ignore what God has done before in his word and is continually doing today. And he wants you to depend upon yourself for every answer. He wants you to depend upon you to try to get through it. He wants you to turn away from the Lord and just try to get it done. And those are lies and deceptions from the evil one. We cannot do it without God. Amen. Satan had seen the writing on the wall, so he's having a garage sale. He knew that his time was coming. Jesus was coming back. And so he's got all of his tools laid out for everyone to buy. Everybody's walking through the tables, and, and they see all of the tools, right? Hatred, envy, jealousy, deceit, lust, lying, pride, and so on. And they're all minimally priced. And one, one person looked at a, a harmless-looking tool. It was well-worn, and it was priced extremely high. So he strikes up a conversation with the devil, and he says, So what's, what's this tool, and why is it so expensive? The devil looked at me and says, ah, because it is the most useful tool that I have than all of the others. I can pry open and get inside a, man, inside a man's heart with that. Even when I can't be near him with the other tools, it's badly worn because I use it on almost everyone since so few people know that it belongs to me. The devil's price for discouragement was high because it is his favorite tool. And he is still using it on God's people. Do not listen to the accusations in your head from the devil that says you can't do that. God can't do that. Because he wants to convince you that God is this small. Instead of trusting in the God that is eternal and can't be bound by anything. The next thing we have to look at, though, in this whole thing is Hezekiah's faith, right? Hezekiah had an incredibly solid faith. Look at, the, at chapter 18, verse 1. In the third year of, king, of Israel's king Hosea, the son of Elah, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, became king of Judah. He was 25 years old when he became king, reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, his mother's name was Abby, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. He removed the high places, shattered the sacred pillars, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake that Moses had made, for the Israelites burned incense to it up to that time, and he called it Nehushtan. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord God of Israel. Not one of the king, kings of Judah was like him either before him or after him. He remained faithful to Yahweh and did not turn from following him, but kept the commands the Lord had commanded Moses. In the midst of the accusations, Hezekiah had a solid faith. Now, it's interesting. When I was researching this, this story is told in three places in the Bible, right? Second Kings, Second Chronicles, and Isaiah. Same story, three places, they all give a few different aspects. The Second Chronicles, right? Second Chronicles goes in depth into the building of Hezekiah's faith. Here we get the first six verses. He removed the high places. He did all this great stuff. Wonderful. If you go into Second Chronicles, beginning in verse 29 and chapter 29, you see that it goes through and it shows big portions of how he did all of these things. Right? How he went through and he repaired the temple, and then he cleansed the temple, and then he cleansed the priests, and he reinstituted worship at the temple. He celebrated the Passover for the first time in hundreds of years. I mean, he was doing all of these great things. He reestablished, right, the priests and the Levites doing all the sacrifices that Moses had told them to do. 
And you look at that and you say, why did they go into so much depth about all this? Well, because we needed to understand, that, and we have the mistake that Hezekiah just automatically had this great faith. Right, that he was just born with this great faith that he trusted in the Lord with everything. And then, boy, from the beginning, he had no problems trusting in the Lord. But that's not the truth. Our faith has to be built. Right? Our faith starts off small, and then it grows, and the Lord strengthens us. Right? And we see that the Lord has to, has to grow us and put us through trials and tribulations so that our faith will grow. Hezekiah didn't automatically have this huge faith. It was something that grew out of all of these years of serving the Lord and obeying Him, facing against those people who said he was crazy for, for, for knocking down the altars of the other gods. He had to face all of the problems that, that a king would face times ten, right? But yet he, he held strong and the Lord grew his faith. We have to understand that our faith is a growing, and it should be growing, portion of our life in Christ. Right? If you stay at the same level of faith and you're not growing, you are a stunted tree. The Lord wants us to grow all the time. And so, and we even get the process here of how he handles this, right? So Hezekiah's faith, the first thing he does when he gets, when, when he hears that the war's coming, the first thing he does is what we all like to do, and he tries to solve his own problem, right? Look down and beginning in verse 14, Hezekiah sent word to the king of Assyria, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me, whatever you demand from me, I will pay. He demanded 11 tons of silver, one ton of gold. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver found in the Lord's temple and the treasuries of the king's palace. At that time, he stripped the gold from the doors of the temple and that it had overlaid, and he gave all of this to the king of Assyria. Right? And he, that, was his, that was his solution. I'm going to give you all this money so you won't come and attack us. Well, you, what happens? They come and they set... They, they make camp with 500,000 soldiers all around and says, hey, that money didn't do anything for us. We still want your kingdom. Right? So the first thing he did was his flesh saying, okay, I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to take care of this. Don't worry, Jerusalem. I'm sending him money. We're going to bribe him. He's going to leave us alone. How did that work out? It doesn't. And let me tell you, when we face a problem, that is one of our first temptations right? We hit something that, that's coming against us. We think, okay, well, I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to make it right. And oftentimes we have to ask the Lord to fix what we mess up when we make that plan. But the thing is, is Hezekiah learned from it. He learned from it. Look, look what he says here. He calls upon the Lord Verse 9, chapter 19, 2 Kings. When King Hezekiah heard the report, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the Lord's temple. He found and realized that his first plan, the brilliant plan of getting rid of all of the gold and silver that the Lord had provided for his temple, getting rid of every valuable thing that they... He said, when that plan didn't work, what did he do? Now he went into the temple that was now bare. It had been beautiful and brilliant, a place to worship the Lord. And now he goes in there, as he's praying, he is reminded of the mistake that he had made. And what does he do? He lays himself at the Lord's temple and he prays. That's the first thing he should have done. And now what does he do? He calls out to the people of, of Jerusalem. And he, he says, you need to offer a prayer you need to pray also. Right? He was not the only one that needed to pray. Hezekiah was the king, but yet he wanted all of the people to pray. And so he prayed, and then he told his main man, he says, you go tell everybody. Y'all get to praying that the Lord will deliver us from his hand. And so they do. They go and they begin to pray. It shows dependence upon the Lord. I know I shouldn't have to say this, but you know, we as a church, we as the people of God believe that prayer matters. 
That's why when we do the welcome, we've got a card in the front of the pew there that you can fill out, and it's got a prayer area, right? We have people, when you, when you turn those in, right, we will, be having, we will have people praying for those things all during the week, right? But, but we only get four or five cards a week, maybe. And the crazy thing about that is I know all of you people. I know there's things in your life that need prayer. I know that you need the Lord to do things in your life. But you know what you're doing, you're keeping it to yourself. You're holding that burden on your own shoulder. You're saying, no, I don't, I'm not going to tell anybody. Some of you have that, I'm not telling anybody my business. And let me just tell you, when you write your prayer request, just give generalities. God knows the specifics. But you see, we're called to pray for each other. And then we also have this thing called the prayer chain in our church. You call the office, you've got something that's going on. There's an accident, there's something. Or, or you need prayer for something, guess what? You call the office, and then we've got people that we call, and then they call other people, and then they call other people. And before you know it, you've got 60 or 70 people praying for you that day and that moment. Come on. And that is, we have seen so many things happen. We have seen the Lord answer prayer after prayer after prayer after prayer. Because we seek Him because we're dependent upon Him. You see, if you are listening to the deception of the devil, your prayer life will stink. Because you think you can handle it and you can do it. And that's the devil's got you right where he wants you. You don't even have to pray about this. Just work on it. Take some vitamins. Get a, help, get a self-help book. Go to Amazon. Buy something. Make you feel better. Right? And you'll try to solve it yourself and you don't pray. But he says, no, we need to pray. But he's not finished. You see, after this, there's something that happens we'll talk about in a moment but then they get another threat they get a threatening letter from the king this letter is is worse it says your god can't do anything and so hezekiah verse 14 he took this threatening letter of accusations again and he takes it to the temple and he takes the letter and he lays it out on the temple floor before the lord and look at his prayer beginning in verse 15. Then Hezekiah prayed for the Lord before the Lord. Lord God of Israel, who is enthroned above the cherubim, you are God. You alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you made the heavens and the earth. Listen closely, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Hear the words that Sennacherib has sent to mock the living God. Lord, it is true that the kings of Assyria have devastated the nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire, for they were not gods at all, but made by human hands, made of wood and stone. So they have destroyed them. Now, Lord God, please save us from his hands so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. Hezekiah made it personal for God. God, you hear what he's saying about you? God, I don't believe him. You go show him that you are the real God, right? He just laid it out there. Now, how could he do that? Because he had faith that had grown from trying to fix his own problem to praying, and now he lays the accusations out before the Lord and says, God, Go get them. Go get them. You see, that is, that is faith. You see, the difference between fear and faith is when the soldiers saw Goliath, right? They said, oh, he's so big, we can't handle him. But David, in his faith, said, oh, he's so big, I can't miss him. Sometimes we live and we look at Goliath and we say, oh, he's too big to handle when we need to have the attitude of, oh, he's too big to miss. You see, Hezekiah had a great faith, 
a great faith. It was based upon seeing God over and over and over again fulfill His Word. We need to have that kind of faith in order to beat the deception of the devil to tell us that we can't do that and that God can't do that. But you see, there is, there is the ending to the story. Chapter 19, verse 5 through 7. The first one we see here, verse 5. So the servants of King Hezekiah went to Isaiah, who said to them, Tell your master this. The Lord says, Don't be afraid because of the words you have heard, that the king of Assyria's attendants have blasphemed me with. I am about to put a spirit in him, and he will hear a rumor and return to his own land when I, where I will cause him to fall by the sword. So the Rabshakeh comes in person and he tells them, don't trust Hezekiah, don't trust in the Lord, don't you just come and just lay down your, your weapons, come follow me and I will take care of you, I will make sure that you eat of your own vine and you're going to have everything you need. And they prayed and Isaiah says, no, nope. God's going to cause a rumor to break out. And so almost overnight, this this army of 500,000 warriors leaves, Whew, gone. You wake up the next morning and everybody's pulling out. What's going on? What happened? The Lord answered our prayer. What? There was no, there was no fighting. There was no skirmishes. No. Just two men didn't meet in the field and, and, and had an arm wrestling contest and the winner was going to leave or the winner was going to lose and, and go. No, it was the fact that they woke up and they were leaving because God had answered their prayer. You see what they did? They sought the Lord and that was it. That's amazing. But then the letter came. Hey, Hezekiah, don't you think that this little skirmish and all our people leaving is going to save you. Your God can't save you. He's not all the other gods we've, we've been victorious over, so don't trust in your God either. And then he lays it out before the Lord. He lays that letter out. Oh, and then chapter 19, beginning in verse 32. This is, therefore, this is what the Lord God says about the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city. He will not shoot an arrow there or come before it with a shield or build up an assault ramp against it. He will go back on the road that he came, and he will not enter this city. This is the Lord's declaration. I will defend this city and rescue it for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Verse 35, that night the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and left. He returned home and lived in Nineveh. One day when he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons, Adram, Melech, and Sherezer, struck him down with the sword and escaped to the land of Ararat. Then his son Esarhaddon became king in his place. A hundred and 85,000 soldiers killed overnight by God. Let me tell you something. When God fixes something, it's fixed. When God moves and he does something, it's done. We need to trust in that, right? You're, he's trying to tell us that our God is small, but it is, it is a lie. It does not matter what you're going through now to God because He can handle it all. All of it. All of it. He is not made tired by handling the wars in other countries. He is not made tired by caring for the poor and, and the ones without food in other countries. He is not tired by... He can handle all of our problems at once and not break a sweat. You see, God is awesome. He is awesome, and we should never forget that. I, I read this story, and it's, it's quite jaw-dropping. True story in Jamaica. Pastor, uh, Pastor Taylor, who'd pastored a church in Jamaica, he had been making headway and leading people to Christ in this small church. And then this man began coming in during the preaching, and he would interrupt the service. 
He would yell and scream and do all this stuff, and he wasn't able to preach the word, and, and they would finally get rid of the man. And this happened week after week after week after week. And the pastor was tired of it. He had been praying about this man, that the Lord would save him, or whatever he would do. And then one time he comes in, and, and the pastor was just done. And Pastor Taylor said this, he said, Lord, I'm seeking to communicate your word to these people. This man refuses to respect that. Would you demonstrate to him before this people today that he is not to play with the living God? Two minutes later, he fell dead in the center aisle. God is still on his throne. He is still far beyond our comprehension. He is still greater than we can imagine. Don't ever think that God can't do that, whatever it is in your life. He can do it. But it takes His people coming before Him and praying, asking Him, God, we need you to do this. I can't do it. I don't have the strength or the ability. But God, you're eternal. You are awesome. Would you do this? And the first and the greatest miracle that God does is when he saves us in Christ. You see, salvation is, is one of the greatest miracles that can happen. Because he is taking someone who is dead in our sins rotten from the core and he is taking us hell is our home that is our destiny and then Jesus came and he died on the cross and he took all of the penalty of sin upon his shoulders and he died for our sins so that we can have forgiveness in him and then he was resurrected on the third day and we have freedom in Christ all of those sins that we've ever committed can be forgiven. We put our faith in Christ and repent of our sins. You see, that's a great miracle because he takes the dead and he brings them to life for eternity. 